Right, brilliant folks. Uh, as my colleague Vicky said, my name is Jim Moore. I'm a development officer with the General Teaching Council for Scotland. And I'm pleased to be able to talk to you this afternoon about key aspects of GTC Scotland's fitness to teach processes and procedures. Now, the numbers for today do seem fairly high, so we'll have to be careful how we manage the discussion. There are different points during the presentation where I will take questions and we can have a bit of discussion. Uh, with high numbers, probably better to make use of the chat facility uh, at that stage. And that way we can still make it a bit interactive, but make sure that the session has been managed appropriately. OK. We'll start off with the learning outcomes for today. So we want to clarify the role of GTC Scotland with regard to fitness to teach and also raise awareness of some crucial aspects of the process. Also want to explain the main stages of the fitness to teach process and clarify the importance of COPAC and what it means for lecturer conduct. We'll clarify the sort of things that GTC Scotland would likely investigate and would likely not investigate and we'll develop insight into the various factors that affect fitness to the fitness to teach process and the decision to investigate or to not investigate. So regulation, which is our term for fitness to teach, and our role in regulation is defined by the Public Services Reform Order of 2011, which gives GTC Scotland a statutory function to regulate the teaching profession on behalf of the public. And the important word there is regulate, not prosecute or punish. Throughout the process, we have a neutral role overseeing the whole process, ensuring that the rules are applied fairly and proportionately at various stages of the process. The key aim of the process is to protect learners, and in doing so, to maintain public confidence and trust in the profession. New fitness to teach rules and a threshold policy were introduced in 2017, and the intention has been to make the process fairer and more transparent with the rules and the threshold policy on the website for everyone to see. It's also important to note that the 2017 rules have a solid legal underpinning as they are approved by the Lord President in the Court of Session in Edinburgh, the highest court in Scotland. And this reflects the very legal nature of our processes with regard to fitness to teach our regulation. We regulate two areas, competence and conduct. Today's presentation will focus on conduct, which as you can see from the slide, accounts for by far the majority by far the majority of our case load. In 2021, that accounted for 90% of cases. So when do GTC Scotland investigate teacher or lecturer conduct? The very first thing we ask ourselves is, does the referral meet the requirements of the threshold policy? The threshold policy sets out what we would and would not investigate and details a lot of the thinking that goes into those decisions. And as I've said, it's freely available on the website. In the context of college lecturers at the moment, a referral is likely to come from information that has come to light during the application process that may have a bearing on the applicant's fitness to teach. And as such, the majority of fitness to teach cases that are being dealt with in relation to college lecturers at the moment as in relation to applications. Although it could also be the case that we receive referrals from college employers or members of the public on a college lecturer's fitness to teach. We investigate what is referred to as relevant conduct. So that's conduct that falls short of the conduct expected of registrants. It's where there's a realistic prospect of a finding of impairment and the behaviours where that would happen are identified in COPAC. COPAC is a Code of Professionalism and Conduct, just to be absolutely clear. 
Separate to COPAC, it's also worth pointing out that we have various professional guides on our website that play no part in the regulation process, but do give some useful advice in areas that may be difficult to navigate, such as the use of social media and meeting the needs of various groups of learners, e.g. dyslexic or autistic learners. And I would encourage you to explore those guides and to make use of them when undertaking professional learning. When we investigate someone's fitness to teach, the test is very much a current test. It's about impairment in the here and now. And that's why we have something called a five year rule, which means that we don't investigate something that happened more than five years ago. Unless, of course, it is of a particular level of seriousness, such as a child protection issue where we would have a duty to investigate regardless of when the incident allegedly happened. Our processes are intended to address a risk of harm and to protect. Openness, honesty, reflection and engagement are key aspects of the process. We recognise that professionals sometimes make mistakes. Teaching and lecturing can be particularly demanding jobs and it would be impossible not to get things wrong sometimes. As stated earlier, the process is not about punishing professionals for mistakes made, but about ensuring that we have adequate protections in place so that learners are properly protected. Where a mistake has been made, it is therefore vital to be open and honest when engaging with the process and to reflect on what went wrong. Where this happens, there's a greater likelihood of a favourable outcome. And where the allegation has been admitted or proven, insight into what went wrong and how things should be handled differently in future is a crucial element of that reflection. So let's now look at the conduct process in a bit of detail. And this graphic outlines the process from start to finish. The process starts with a referral and a referral can come in from a variety of sources. A member of the public, the employer, the courts or even Disclosure Scotland. When we receive a referral, it goes through the first stage of our processes, which is initial consideration. At initial consideration, the referral is initially considered by a member of the regulation team using a threshold policy. Now that's a very quick process. It's approximately two weeks long. And in that period, we decide whether or not we need to investigate based on the information given within the referral. Reasons why we wouldn't investigate a referral at this stage include the conduct not representing relevant conduct, which I referred to earlier. It could be that it has already been considered after being received from someone else with different wording, uh, maybe the referral was deemed to be frivolous or vexatious. It's important to know that these reasons can lead to the case against a teacher or lecturer being dismissed not only at this stage, but also at other stages of the process after having gathered more information on the matter. And it's interesting to note that 40 to 50 percent of referrals tend to exit at this stage, which is a fairly high number. If it doesn't exit at this stage, it then moves on to the investigation stage. At the investigation, the investigation stage, the allegations within the referral are investi investigated by one of our regulation officers, and they spend a lot of time talking to witnesses, taking statements, gathering information, and finding out exactly what happened. Once the regulation officer has managed to pull all the information together, they fill out an investigation report. And the recommendation within the report will be that there is no impairment and the case should be closed, or that it needs to move on to the next stage. And that next stage would be panel consideration. It moves on to this stage unless a regulation officer decides to close the, close the case after investigating it, as I've already said. 
at panel consideration, a panel meets in private and all the evidence that has been gathered is examined by the panel, including any responses from the lecturer. The panel consists of two registered teachers and one lay member, ensuring a certain level of understanding of different aspects of education, which can sometimes be crucial when deliberating on a case and trying to reach a decision. Different options are open to a panel at panel consideration. They could find no impairment and therefore no further action is taken, or a consent order is issued with one of the following disposals. And disposal is simply a word, the legal word for a decision. The disposals could be that a re reprimand is placed against the teacher's name on the register for a period of time. Or it could be a conditional reg registration order, which means that te the teacher or lecturer is allowed to keep the registration, but certain conditions are placed on it to ensure that they remain fit to teach. It could be a combination of a reprimand and a conditional registration order, or it could be removal from the register. The panel could decide to refer the case for a hearing if they consider it, if they consider that to be necessary in the circumstances. And it's important to know that any consent order at this stage can only apply with the consent of the teacher or lecturer. If they do not consent to the consent order, it then automatically goes to a full hearing so that both parties can have their say. So full hearing, which would be the final stage of our processes. And as I've just said, the case can reach that stage if the panel refers the case for a hearing, or if a consent order is issued but not accepted or signed by the teacher or lecturer. Now the full hearing is the opportunity for the evidence to be openly tested in front of a GTC Scotland panel. A presenting officer would present the case for GTC Scotland the teacher or lecturer is likely to be represented by a representative of his or her choice, perhaps a union official, who is there to act in the best interests of the teacher or lecturer. The panel deliberating on the case again consists of two registered teachers and one lay member. At the full hearing, the panel will determine the facts of the matter based on the evidence and applying the balance of probabilities, will come to a decision on the allegations. If some or all of the allegations are found proven, then the panel will determine the teacher's fitness to teach. The potential outcomes at this stage are the same as the potential outcomes at the panel consideration stage. In other words, no impairment and therefore no further action. A reprimand being placed against the lecturer's name in the register, a conditional re registration order, meaning that the lecturer can keep their registration, but certain conditions are placed on it to ensure that they remain fit to teach, a combination of a reprimand and conditional registration order, or removal from the register. So that outlines the role of GTC Scotland with regard to investigating conduct through the fitness to teach process. And then the slides that follow, we will look at the role of COPAC and explore the type of conduct we would likely or not likely investigate as a regulator of the profession. But before we do that, we'll pause for a few seconds and give you the opportunity to type any questions that you may have about our conduct processes into the chat facility. But over a hundred here today, I can see that from my screen. Uh, so it's probably better that we do use the chat facility. So anything regarding the process, if there's anything you want to clarify, there's a lot of information there. Uh, if you just type it into the chat facility and I'll try and clarify it. Regarding what we investigate and what we wouldn't investigate, I'm going to come on to that. So let's stay clear of that for just now. But just anything regarding the process or anything that drives the process. If you have any questions about that, can you just type it in? Okay. 
OK, nothing at the moment. And we'll give it another few seconds. And if nothing comes in, we'll just move on. OK, we shall move on then. Oh. I'm asked, uh, Jim, would you agree that COPAC is written for school, so is inappropriate for the college sector? I wouldn't agree that it's inappropriate for the college sector. It was written for schools. Yes, that is true. Uh, but when you look at the conduct in COPAC, which I'm just about to come on to, John, uh, it could apply to the college sector also. And who is this training actually intended for? Uh, this training is intended for college lecturers. You mentioned that referrals can come in for applications. Is that applications to become a lecturer initially? The application to become a lecturer, that would be down to your employ the where you're employed. So the employer process is there. That's nothing to do with us. Uh, but certainly within any employer uh, application form, there may be a question about that. But as I say, that's down to the employer. That's not down to us. I think that answers that question. Uh, would the two registered teachers include lecturer representation to allow for further education context to be considered? Anyone who's, a, who's registered on the register of teachers, does it? There's a legal, it's a legal term register of teachers order that actually set us up as an organisation which I referred to in one of the slides, the 2011 order. It refers to the register of teachers. Now, I'm fully aware that I'm not talking to teachers this afternoon, that I'm talking to college lecturers, but it is just a term that is used in the order. Uh, so please don't take any offence at that. Anyone who is registered on that register could be part of a panel. There is a process for applying to be a panel member. And if I remember rightly, I think it's every four years that process comes around. That is run by the regulation team. So if you are on the register of teachers, you can apply to be a panel member. So it is all inclusive. OK, I shall move on with the rest of the presentation. OK, so COPAC, the Code of Professionalism and Conduct. This is a key point of reference when investigating professional conduct because it is used to base decisions on whether a referral about an applicant or a registered lecturer relates to conduct that would meet the test of relevant conduct that I referred to earlier and should therefore result in a referral to GTC Scotland. If it meets the test of relevant conduct, we would expect a referral to come in. So what do we know already know about COPAC and how does the content of the document affect your role as a college lecturer? So to start off with here, I'm going to talk you through the document, but before I do that, I'm interested to know what you know already about COPAC and then we can clear up any misunderstandings that may exist out there. So if you just type into the chat facility, the sort of things that you think COPAC covers. And L Lorraine has asked when I refer to lecturers, am I including promoting lecturers too? Yes. Right, so I'll see what comes in here. So nothing yet in the process of registering, OK. Right, I'm getting questions about going forward with COPAC. Can we leave those to later on, Lynn? I'm not too sure what you're getting at there, but certainly after we go through the behaviours, we can address anything there. Right, nothing coming in regarding the behaviours. OK, so if that's the case, I will simply move on. 
and talk through the behaviours that are covered by COPAC. OK, so COPAC, right, this slide here shows you the three, the key principles of COPAC. And just as I put that slide up, someone has come in with bullying and harassment of students, unacceptable, which is absolutely correct. But we'll talk through this slide. So I'm going to run through the behaviours identified in COPAC. And it starts off with part one. Part one is entitled professionalism and maintaining trust in the profession. Now that's about having knowledge of and maintaining the key principles in GTC Scotland documents, such as the professional standards and COPAC, so professional standards for college lecturers. It's about maintaining appropriate professional boundaries and avoiding improper contact or relationships with learners. It's about avoiding situations within and out with the professional context, which could be in breach of criminal law or may call into question someone's fitness to teach. It's about upholding standards of personal and professional conduct, honesty and integrity. It's about acting with integrity in your dealings and correspondence with professional bodies. And it's about being a good role model to learners in all that you do. Part two of COPAC is entitled Professional Responsibilities Towards Learners. And that's about treating sensitive personal information about learners with respect and confidentiality. It's about being truthful, honest and fair in relation to information you provide about learners. It's about motivating learners to realise their full potential. It's about maintaining up to date knowledge of and complying with child and protected adult protection procedures. It's about raising any concerns you may have about the behaviour of a colleague and connection with a child or protected adult. And it's about being aware of the general principles of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child and ensuring that you act on that awareness so that you're acting in the best interests of learners. Part three of COPAC is entitled Professional Competence. That's about maintaining and developing professional practice to ensure that teachers and lecturers meet the appropriate professional competence requirements. And it's about refreshing and developing knowledge and skills through appropriate professional learning. Part four of COPAC is entitled Professionalism Towards Colleagues, Parents and Carers. That's about working in a collegiate and cooperative manner with colleagues and other professionals. It's about treating all colleagues, parents and carers fairly and without discrimination. It's about not making malicious or unfounded criticisms of or accusations about colleagues that may undermine them professionally. It's about promoting good relationships between home and the learning community and respecting the role of parents. It's about taking great care when expressing opinions in public about your employer. And it's about being mindful of Data Protection Act requirements, now superseded, of course, by GDPR requirements with the information that you hold. Part five of COPAC is entitled Equality and Diversity. That's about engaging and working positively with learners, colleagues, parents and carers in an open, inclusive and respectful way. It's about helping learners to understand different views, perspectives and experiences. And it's about being aware of the potentially serious impact that any demonstration of intolerance or prejudice could have upon your standing as a teacher or lecturer and your fitness to teach. So the, those are the main behaviours identified by COPAC. And there's a lot of information in that last slide. 
What we're going to do now is look at some mock scenarios and try to apply what we've just been learning about the content of COPAC. What I want you to do here is to decide whether you think GTC Scotland would be likely to investigate such a scenario or not, and also to give reasons as to why or why not. This section is all about developing your thinking and understanding in this area. It's not about right or wrong answers, so simply go with your gut if unsure, and we can pick up in the main points as we look at the different scenarios and develop that thinking and, that, and understanding. OK, very first scenario, and just type your answers into the chat facility. So first scenario, a lecturer gets intimately involved with one of his or her students going out on a Saturday night. Is that the kind of thing that GTC Scotland would likely investigate or not? So if you type in yes or no, and if you can give any reasons as to why yes or no, that would be helpful. As I say, there's a lot of us in the call, uh, so I'll take the first few answers just to gauge the general feeling out there. So yes, under part one, professionalism. Yes, yes, coming in. Right, I'll say yes so far, unacceptable, under professionalism. And I'm glad to see this word professionalism because that's really what this is all about. Yes. Right, OK, I think we can move on. I think we've got a clear feeling there that the answer is yes. And you're quite right. Of course, we would likely investigate a situation like that. It's deemed as not maintaining appropriate professional boundaries. COPAC 1.2, someone mentioned part one of COPAC there. There are ethical questions here around relationships and the sort of relationships that are appropriate for lecturers to engage in with students. It's not just about age, which can make things clear cut in a school setting, for instance. One of the questions earlier was about uh, as COPAC suitable for the college sector. Some things can be clear cut in the school setting, but there's other factors which are just as relevant in the college sector as would be relevant in the school setting, such as power di differentials that exist in certain relationships. When looking at anything here, we'd be looking at has the lecturer taken advantage of his or her position? Has there effectively been a degree of grooming? So we have to consider those issues and we have to look at the big picture when looking at the detail and things that happen. And remember that big picture also includes protecting the reputation of the profession so that the profession continues to be held in high regard in the eyes of the general public. And quite a few of you mentioned the word professionalism, which is a key word there. It's about protecting that sense of professionalism in your professional standing as a college lecturer in Scotland. OK. Next scenario, a lecturer passes on information to an examination awarding body that a learner has passed all coursework and that is not the case. Investigate or not. And before I pick up and answers, I see there's a general question here. Uh, I heard that there will be no co-pack for lecturers as initially planned for this year. Hence the importance of this session, yep. And it's even possible that more than simply a delay may not be created at all. Please, can you clarify? That is presently being looked at. There is no decision on that. That's all the clarification that can be given there. We're taking account of all views when it comes to this. There's an ongoing process. We're looking at ethics. We're looking at the role of ethics in education. We're taking views of teachers and lecturers. Uh, before deciding on what is going to happen with COPAC. The intention is for COPAC to be replaced, whether it's replaced with one code, whether it's going to be separate codes for school or college lecturers. No decision has been made in that, and I'm afraid that's all the information I can give you at the moment. But rest assured, we're going through due diligence and we're taking account of all views on that one before any decisions are made. So for this particular scenario, what do you think? Would we investigate this? And if so, 
but if not, why yes or why no? So Lynn is saying yes. Potentially yes, but this would be likely picked up by the awarding body and the lecturer's employer in the first instance. And that is a good point, yes, and I'll come to that. Yes. Part two about sensitivity, confidentiality. Yep. Investigate. Yes. So most people are saying yes. OK, malpractice being mentioned. Right, so let's get the answer for this. And yes, we would likely investigate this sort of scenario. It's deemed as not upholding standards of honesty and integrity, which is COPAC 1.4. And also not being truthful, honest and fair in relation to information you provide about learners, which was mentioned uh, by someone in the chat. So 2.2. Intention would be an important consideration here, however. And it may be that the lecturer passing on the inf information didn't do so deliberately and that it was a mistake. If that's clear from the information in the referral, we would likely not investigate and the case would be dismissed at initial consideration. As I said earlier, initial consideration, very quick process, which allows us to get rid of cases out of the system, which really we don't need to investigate. Initial consideration is a fortnight and we can get, we invariably get rid of 40 or 50 percent of cases out of the system with initial consideration. Equally, if we don't have the level of detail regarding exactly what happened here, we would likely have to investigate but we could close the case down if it becomes apparent during the investigation that it was not intentional. Often we need the lecturer's input for this type of evaluation and that often doesn't come until we investigate the detail. As I said earlier, our processes are not about punishing professionals for mistakes made, but about ensuring that learners are, are protected moving forward and that the reputation of the profession is also protected. OK, next scenario. A lecturer regularly turns up late for work in the morning and for different classes. Could we investigate that or not? Yes or no, and reasons as to why yes or no. So yes, no, it's an internal HR issue. So difference of opinion straight away, no. Most people are now saying no, internal discipline up to the manager, employer responsibility, internal investigation first. OK, and the majority of answers are absolutely right. No, we would likely not investigate this. This is deemed a matter for the employer. The only exception may be if a learner is harmed because the lecturer is not where the lecturer should have been. That could change it slightly, but certainly initially it's a matter for the employer. Uh, it was touched on before in the previous uh, scenario about passing on wrong information to an awarding body and I forgot to pick up on it, so I'll just quickly address it just now that things will be investigated at employer level first, and that will generally be the case. So your employer will look into these things, and very often if there is something that is not relevant conduct, your employer will make a decision to send a referral on to GTC Scotland. So in most cases, it will be your employer that is involved initially. What we are looking at here is whether this is something that would likely be passed on to us and whether we are likely to investigate it or not. But this one here would be entirely for the employer. There are certain things that are deemed a matter for the employer and will always be dealt with at that level without the need for GTC Scotland to be involved. And this is one of those scenarios. We are legally required to carry out the fitness to teach process in a way that is proportionate and targeted. And to only take 
take action where necessary. And this is an example of conduct that can be managed by the employer and it would not be proportionate for regulatory action to be taken. As I've said, if a learner were harmed, however, because the lecturer had neglected his or her duties, it then becomes more serious. And at that stage, we would expect to be informed of the matter and depending on the circumstances, may have to investigate. OK, next scenario. Two colleagues do not get on to the extent that they do not work together on matters of mutual interest, like sharing of resources and planning for shared classes, which ultimately has an impact on learner attainment. Would we investigate that or not? What do you think? And again, yes or no, and reasons. If you can think of any reasons. Again, an internal issue, Kevin is saying, so no. No, again, internal. Once again, it's a matter to be resolved internally. Again, employer first. There appears to be clear consensus here. Anyone saying otherwise? We'll give it a few seconds. No, unless referred by the employer. Internal issue. Unless impact on learners was extremely significant, and that is a good point, Vivian. This one would very much depend on the circumstances, although you're all quite right. Initially, it would be dealt with by the employer. So it's therefore initially deemed a matter for the employer. Even though part four of COPAC is about professionalism towards colleagues, the employer is best situated to make a judgment on exactly what is happening between the two professionals in this scenario. We would therefore have to be proportionate and it would be better for the employer to investigate and then determine whether the conduct is the conduct we would expect of a registered lecturer and to decide whether anyone should be referred to GTC Scotland for behaviour that would be considered relevant conduct. OK, next scenario. At the weekend, a lecturer posts a message on social media, verbally abusing colleagues they work with and criticising students they teach. Would we investigate that or not? Someone said 4.2. So straight away, yes, from Mark. Ryan also saying yes, Francis also. Quite a few yeses now coming in. All saying yes so far. Part four, professionalism towards colleagues. Bringing the profession into disrepute. Someone saying think it's also an internal one. Yes, an appropriate use of social media, bringing the profession into disrepute. And you're quite right. Yes, we would likely investigate this sort of scenario. It's deemed as not being an appropriate role model, COPAC 1.6, and not upholding standards of personal and professional conduct, COPAC 1.4. Could also be in breach of 2.1. You must treat sensitive personal information about learners with respect and confidentiality and could be in breach of making malicious or unfounded criticisms of or accusations about colleagues that may undermine them professionally. 4.3, which I think was picked up on in the chat. Professional, professionals really need to be careful with their use of social media. You shouldn't go posting anything online that could be perceived as malicious or just having a go. Reputation matters and the perception of others matter, so professionals always need to be aware of that. They may not be at work when they post, but they are still recognised as a professional person by many people. And sometimes that means being held to a high level of accountability, whether they're at work or not. It's often said that when you're a teacher, you're a teacher 24-7, and the same principle would of course apply to lecturers. 
engaging someone's fitness to teach. That can be particularly so in the case of social media because of how comments or posts can be perceived by others. Also, once you post something, you no longer have control over it and it can be manipulated or used by others online for their own purposes. So lecturers and other professionals really need to be careful with their use of social media and really need to think about what they are posting. OK, I'm going to pull a lot of that information together in the next few slides and this slide pulls a lot of the information from that previous section together. And let's just see the sort of things that GTC Scotland would likely investigate as a professional regulator. The situations are informed by the conduct referred to in COPAC and are also listed in the threshold policy, which explains what we would regard as relevant conduct and the different factors that influence that thinking. We would investigate or we would likely investigate, everything depends on the circumstances, but we would likely investigate abuse of a lecturer's position of trust. It's not upholding standards of personal and professional conduct, COPAC 1.4. Forming inappropriate relationships with learners young people, is COPAC 1.2 not maintaining appropriate professional boundaries. Behaviour of a violent, aggressive or threatening nature, which is 1.3, could be in breach of criminal law and also not upholding standards of personal and professional conduct. Sexual misconduct or indecency, again for the same reasons. Behaviour which demonstrates intolerance or prejudice of another's background, personal circumstances, cultural differences, values and beliefs. That's about not being open, inclusive and respectful. And the potentially serious impact that intolerance and prejudice could have on another person. Substance abuse and misuse for some of the reasons that I mentioned earlier. And also misuse of social media where it relates to a lecturer's practice, displays discriminatory or intolerant views, or includes abusive or offensive language or raises any other serious concerns. So again, the intolerance or the, and the discrimination being important elements there. We would likely investigate fraud or dishonesty or any other serious activities which cause harm and affect public confidence. You will see that the behaviours are listed here are of a particular level of seriousness and there's good reason for that. When we're considering taking action against a professional regarding the fitness to teach, we're talking about someone's livelihood possibly being at stake. So it's a serious business with serious consequences. We therefore have to be proportionate and ensure that we are acting in cases where we need to act to protect the public interest and to protect learners and the reputation of the profession. I should also point out that employers have a legal duty to refer a matter to us under circumstances where they have dismissed the lecturer due to misconduct, which may very well be the case with the situations mentioned on this slide, or where the lecturer stops working for the employer under circumstances where they would have or might have dismissed the lecturer for misconduct. That's a legal requirement for any employer and one that everyone should be aware of so that it doesn't come as a surprise when an employer makes a referral under such circumstances. Factors that affect the decision to investigate or not, there are different factors that would inform that decision. And these include the age of the behaviour, the five year rule that I mentioned earlier. If it happened more than five years ago, we would tend not to investigate unless it were of a particular level of seriousness, such as a child protection issue, which we would be duty bound to investigate regardless of when it allegedly happened. We would also look at the degree of harm and ask if the risk of harm is real and probable. If it were, we would be more likely to investigate. We would ask if this was a one-off incident or if it was part of a pattern of behaviour. 
if part of a pattern of behaviour, it could be indicative of more serious underlying issues, which may very well affect someone's fitness to teach. Driving under the influence, for instance, may not be considered as serious if it's a one-off incident, which is totally out of character, even though it is a serious thing to do. But if it has happened more than once, it could be considered more serious. And if a student was in the car at the time, it may be considered even more serious again, because a student or young person could have been at risk of harm due to the lecturer's actions. We would ask, has the behaviour been addressed and is it likely or unlikely to happen again? Remember, when we're talking about fitness to teach, it's about fitness to teach in the here and now. We will look at the steps that have been taken to address any shortfalls in behaviour. We basically do a risk assessment of current circumstances. And a key consideration in any case that we look at, as I've already touched on, are openness, honesty, reflection and insight. As mentioned earlier, we accept that professionals sometimes make mistakes. Some mistakes can be more serious than others, however, and there are certain things from which there is no way back. But a lot of the time, there's a chance to remediate and to learn from any mistakes made. Throughout our processes, we therefore expect lecturers to engage, to be honest when reflecting on incidents, and to show insight and learn from any mistakes made so that such mistakes are unlikely to occur again. Where this is the case, there is more chance of a favourable outcome. It goes back to what I said earlier about it's not about punishing lecturers for mistakes made, but ensuring that learners are properly protected. We would also consider intention. And we'd ask, was the action deliberate or was it a mistake? If it was deliberate, it would of course be treated more seriously. And we would look at whether it was a system failure or whether it was misconduct on the part of an individual. We can only investigate regi registrants, so individuals. If it's a policy failure or something that happened due to a lack of support and no individual registrant was responsible, it's not the kind of thing we would look at. That's for other people to look at. Not likely to be investigated. Lightness of poor timekeeping, as we saw in the scenarios. Also, abandoning post unless this has harmed a young or vulnerable person, or such harm is probable. Personality conflicts are similar between colleagues. It would first be addressed at the local level, uh, so by the employer. And they may refer it on if there is evidence of bullying or harassment or any such other behaviour which would. Uh, which could, could come under relevant conduct. We would not likely investigate smoking tobacco contrary to an employer's policy or anything else contrary to an employer's policy for that matter. Misuse of work property for personal use, minor plagiarism and also fixed penalty notices unless learners were involved and were at risk of harm as we saw from the driving under the influence uh, section that I talked about. These examples are also listed in the threshold policies, things that we would not be likely to investigate. And they're mostly issues that would be dealt with by the employer. OK, and I see that a question has come in uh, while I was talking there. So another point for us to stop and to ask any questions and this time we can concentrate on COPAC and the sort of things that we would likely and would not likely investigate and the factors that affect the decision. There were quite a few of those factors there. I've been asked by someone, how can you prove intention? Proving anything is uh, very difficult, uh, but our regulation officers are trained to, they're trained in investigation processes. Uh, so they would actually be better equipped to answer that question than me. Uh, but there have been various uh, cases that have gone through our processes where they have had to look at intention and they've had to find a way of proving whether intention was part of that 
that teachers it normally was. As I say, lecturers are fairly new to the register or part of that, that teacher's actions. So it can certainly be done. With regard to professional boundaries, would you recommend that college lecturers no longer attend student nights out, e.g. end of term drinks in bars or night clubs? That is really a personal decision to make. What I would say about that sort of thing is that uh, it's a it's a different uh, scenario with college than it is in the school. That sort of thing in a school setting would maybe raise more questions. In a college setting, it may not. But if you do attend anything like that, then be aware of what is expected of you in terms of conduct as a college lecturer. Uh, it's about being professional and maintaining those professional boundaries. So it's not saying that you can't go to nightclubs or you can't attend any events like that. It's about being cognizant of your behaviour in those situations and making sure that you don't do anything that would call into question your professionalism. Any other questions coming in? That seems to be it so far. We'll give it a few seconds before moving on to the final part of the presentation. OK, we shall move on. Right, this time we're going to look at real life case scenarios. And we're going to use these to develop our insight. So a number of case scenarios. Before we look at these, I'll remind you of the possible disposals or outcomes that are open to a GTC Scotland panel whether that be at panel consideration or at full hearing. A panel could find no impairment against the teacher or lecturer and therefore no further action is taken. They may decide that there is impairment, but it's not too serious and that a reprimand being placed, placed against the teacher or lecturer's name in the, the register would be enough under the circumstances. They may decide on a conditional registration order, which is where the teacher or lecturer is allowed to keep their registration. But certain conditions are placed on that registration to ensure that they remain fit to teach. It may be a combination of both a reprimand and a conditional registration order, or it may be the ultimate sanction, removal from the register. So if you can take a note of those, I'm going to move on with slides. But if you can just take a quick note of those possible impairments. And again, for this, there are no right or wrong answers here. It's all about developing thinking and understanding and the different factors uh, when looking at cases as we receive them. And also be aware that the majority of case scenarios here have been taken from the school setting. Uh, and that's simply because college lecturer registration is still at an early stage and we don't have many cases to choose from for this sort of exercise. So as I say, this is simply about developing your thinking and understanding of some of the factors involved in reaching a disposal or a decision. So be aware that you only have a certain amount of information also with these scenarios. And we'll basically use them as an opportunity to explore some of the main issues. And thank you to Bill Crawford, who I see has very helpfully put the, that slide into the chat facility. So you can all see the possible disposals as we move on. Good idea, Bill. Thanks for that. OK, first case study. So this was to do with inappropriate comments to pupils and inappropriate conduct towards colleagues. The case involved a range of behaviour 
including making inappropriate comments to pupils about the school, other teachers, the curriculum for excellence, and the Scottish independence referendum. The teacher was also alleged to have sworn in front of pupils. A significant part of the case involved the teacher's conduct towards colleagues. So with this proposal, do you think a panel would have reached with a case like this? And what are the key factors here? That is really a more important question because, as I say, you only have a limited amount of it amount of information to actually decide on a disposal. So that's a secondary thing for this sort of exercise. But what are the key factors that we're looking at when we're talking about COPAC and professionalism in the case of conduct? Or professionalism with regard to conduct? Just type in what you think into the chat facility again. We are doing very well time wise. I was hoping that we would have about 10 minutes towards the end where I can actually allow you to unmute and ask questions. I think we're OK for that at the moment. So just to make you aware of that. So we'll continue to use the chat facility, but we'll be able to get a bit of feedback right at the end of the presentation. And a chance to actually discuss openly. Right, so what are your thoughts for this one? Unprofessional behaviour. Yep. And it's Camille saying that, and I think we would all agree that that is unprofessional behaviour. Absolutely, Camille. Disrespecting colleagues. Reprimand the lecturer is what Mark is thinking. Anything else coming in? Reprimands. Thank you, Camille. I was a language teacher in a previous life, uh, so maybe my language skills have come in useful there. Conditional registration, Kevin is saying. Perhaps give the person time to address questions about their conduct and show how they have improved. And that would be a good use of a conditional registration order, Kevin, absolutely. Because the registration here does depend on improvements. OK, folks, I think we'll go with the answer. And this might shock one or two of you. But remember, you were only given some limited information at the start of this. The disposal here was that the teacher was removed from the register and is prohibited from seeking re-registration for a two year period, which is the maximum period. And I'll go into exactly why that was the case. As I say, you were only given limited information on the first slide. The teacher admitted the allegations and given the severity of the pattern of behaviour, a removal with consent order was issued and the teacher's name was removed from the register. The teacher had serious mental health issues, which in spite of treatment had not been addressed and there was a very real likelihood of similar behaviour reoccurring. That likelihood of reoccurrence is a crucial consideration in all cases. Because if that likelihood is still there, then learners are still at risk of harm. And a disposal or a decision has to be reached that protects and is seen to protect moving forward. Not just learners, but also protects the reputation of the profession. And that's why the disposal was so severe in this case. These issues that the teacher was experiencing were in fact so severe that the teacher's name being publicised would have led to a very real threat of suicide according to medical evidence. So we'll look at that evidence as part of any consideration 
and the case was therefore anonymised. Cases being anonymised are not the norm because we have due regard, we have to have due regard to the public interest and the public interest demands transparency. But the possibility is there if there's a real danger of harm to the teacher or lecturer by naming them. In such circumstances, the danger to the teacher or lecturer has to be weighed up against the public interest. And in this case, the danger was so severe that it outweighed the openness and transparency that we would normally expect to see in cases, and therefore it was anonymised. So quite a few things to consider with that one. As I say, the disposal itself is not the important thing here. It's about developing your understanding of the different factors that are involved. Now, we'll move on to the second one. This one was to do with dishonesty. The teacher was found to have lied to his employer regarding the reason for requiring time off school. The teacher had told his employer that he was needing to bring his wife home from hospital, while in fact he was supporting a friend who had been convicted of child sexual abuse in court. What are your thoughts? What, with, what are the main issues? What do you think the disposal would be? What are the key considerations here? Now, Mary is saying need to look at circumstances, effects of the behaviour and said so that was for the previous one and staff and students and look at its severity. And you were quite right with that, Mary, absolutely. The severity is one of the things that actually made that such a severe disposal. For this one, Kamali is saying trust and transparency issues there. Yes, absolutely. Honesty and integrity, yep. Reprimand is what we are thinking, and it would be an HR matter uh, at for the employer. Yes, absolutely. Again, reprimand coming in. I think it's, if someone is tried and convicted as a teacher, you'd really have to consider those consequences. Yes. Francis also saying reprimand. And professional conduct of lying, we'd imagine this is very severe, would possibly go down with removal, someone is thinking. Association with the person with child abuse, which could be a factor, Kevin, yeah. But most of us are saying reprimand. And your, your thinking is bang on with this. It was actually a conditional registration order and a reprimand for 18 months. The teacher had originally denied the lie when confronted by the head teacher about his whereabouts, but then admitted he had lied when an internal investigation was conducted by the local authority, then showed remorse and cooperated fully. Showing genuine remorse, cooperating fully, demonstrating insight and reflection into what you have done wrong, as I've already mentioned, are key considerations in any case. And we've seen that from the earlier slides. They're important elements of remediation and of demonstrating to a panel that the likelihood of harm moving forward is low. It can be about learning from situations, but that learning has to be genuine so that there is a low risk of harm moving forward. And that was the case in this case. The GTC Scotland panel considered that there were mitigating circumstances in this case, however, and that the friend had previously been supportive of the teacher and his wife in a time of need, and also considered that the conduct was remediable and that un under the circumstances, a reprimand would satisfy the public interest. So most of the thinking, as I say, was absolutely bang on because initially the panel were moving towards a reprimand. In this case, however, the teacher was already on a reprimand due to a previous misdemeanor. And a more severe disposal was necessary to satisfy the public interest and to protect the reputation of GTC Scotland as a regulator. In 
that's why the conditional registration order was also added on. It then has to be more severe. If already on a reprimand, the disposal of decision has to be more severe to reflect the severity of the issue and to reflect how seriously we take the issue of professional conduct. It can't be treated the same and more has to be done to ensure learners remain protected. The conditional registration order can be a great tool here as it allows conditions to be placed against the teacher's or lecturer's registration that are designed to address the specific conduct. In this case, the conditions of the conditional registration order involve the teacher preparing a personal development plan, which set out proposals for avoiding dishonest behaviour in future, and the teacher submitting three reflective pieces to GTC Scotland over the next three school terms, addressing his previous dishonest behaviour and what he'd learnt from it. Next scenario. I've got a question here from Ryan just before I read this scenario. It says they were convicted. It was a friend that was convicted in that one, Ryan. Uh, if I'm not picking up on what you're trying to get at there, if you just come back in, but it was a friend that was convicted, not the teacher. Uh, the third one here, conduct dishonesty, and I've managed to find one that applies to the college registration process. So an applicant for registration had been convicted a number of decades ago of an assault and sentenced to imprisonment. He failed to declare this on his application for registration with GTC Scotland. And Ryan has clarified, he's just replying to Lorraine. OK, thanks, Ryan. So what do you think here, folks? What are the key issues? What are the key factors? What do you think the disposal would be in this scenario? No impairment because it was spent more than five years ago. Kevin is asking the question. No impairment, number of decades ago, no impairment, dishonesty, but time elapsed would be important. Even though it happened a long time ago, GTCS would expect him to be honest in his application. More than five years ago, no impairment. Excellent, folks. You totally have the hang of this. No impairment found. And so a lot of the points were made that were made in the chat, I'll pick up on here. The applicant provided a response explaining the circumstances of the offence and showing insight and remorse. The case was closed during the investigation on the basis of the period of time since the conviction, so more than five years ago. It was an isolated incident. And the insight and remorse shown by the applicant indicated that they had fully remediated and that such conduct was unlikely to occur again, which was picked up or picked up on in the chat. Surely not disclosing it would be an issue, though. Is what Claire is saying, is that not dishonesty? Now, the applicant didn't declare it on his application. But when we went back to the applicant on that, it was deemed that it wasn't done de deliberately as dishonesty because of how long ago it was. So once more information came out, you're quite right to question that, Claire, because dishonesty would be an important factor. But when we delved into this a bit more, it was actually found that it probably was just a genuine mistake because it was that long ago and there was nothing more to look at here. Next one, and this is the final one. So the allegation here, again, is to do with a conviction. 
The allegation is that a teacher assaulted a member of the public whilst on a night out with his wife and another couple. The teacher had been challenged by an individual and he, he kicked out, causing the individual to fall and injure his head. He was arrested at the time and reported the incident to his employer the next day. The teacher was convicted of assault. What do you think? The main factors, main things to consider, and what do you think the disposal would be? And there's a few questions about uh, criminal record only lasting 10 years. Uh, not too sure if that is the case and the applicant being aware of five year gap, is it then even relevant? Not declaring it was considered not to be that relevant in this case, Ryan. Uh, once the case was looked into, the previous case that is. So someone saying removal, bringing the profession into disrepute. Would it be determined by the aggressive or threatening? Be determined by the extremity of the assault, GBH as opposed to minor, could be a consideration. Behaviour of a violent, aggressive or threatening nature, 1.3 and 1.4. Yep, those are certainly relevant factors, Kevin. It's outside the education setting. Doesn't matter that it's outside the education setting. Remember, we are teachers and lecturers 24-7. It's about the conduct. But Kamali is also suggesting perhaps a reprimand by the head teacher. I'm sure that internally something would have happened there. But in terms of any action that we would take, what do you think? In terms of reprimand will maybe depend on the severity, so could lead to removal. Need to know a lot more. What is his record like? Is this a one off? Is he extremely re remorseful? Looks awful though, reprimand to begin with. And Mary, you're absolutely right. And as I've said already, you don't have all the information on these slides, but the things that you mentioned there, remorse, uh, previous record, is it a one off? These are all things that come into it. Of course they are. And that is probably a good time to move on to what actually happened. In light of that comment there, Mary, because the panel issued a reprimand with consent order for 12 months here. So with consent order, that means it was at the panel uh, consideration stage. So the teacher consented to it. In this case, there were strong mitigating circumstances. The teacher had been verbally abused and feared for the safety of his wife, himself and his friends, another couple, due to the aggressive nature of the abuse. At one point, he kicked out, causing another person to fall and bang his head. The teacher was arrested, fully cooperated with the police and reported the incident to his employer the next day. He engaged with the local disciplinary and GTC Scotland processes and the incident was considered to be a one-off incident, as Mary picked up on, with no likelihood of reoccurrence. It was therefore considered that there was no threat to the public interest and that a reprimand with consent order would suffice. So as I say, decided at panel consideration stage, that's why it says with consent order, the teacher consented to it. And we can see that the teacher cooperated fully at all stages of the process here and was genuinely remorseful at getting caught up in the incident. Remember, risk of harm moving forward is a key consideration. Even though the behaviour here was violent, the teacher was provoked, was acting in self-defence, and the public interest could be satisfied that this was not a violent person. And therefore, there was, there, there was therefore little likelihood of reoccurrence, and that was an important consideration. So hopefully you have found all that useful, folks. And I want you now to think about the implications here for you as a 
college lecturer. What does all of this mean for you in your role as a college lecturer? Is there anything in particular you can do to minimise the possibility of falling foul of the conduct expected when registered with GTC Scotland? Are there any areas where professional learning or further discussion about the conduct expected would help? What are the key things for you? And at this stage, you can simply unmute. Timing has been absolutely bang on. I did say I was thinking we would have 10 minutes left by the time we got to the end. Uh, we're at 15.19, so just over 10 minutes. And it is a lovely Friday afternoon out there, so I'm certainly not averse to finishing early. If that turns out to be the case, I'm sure you are. But if anyone wants to unmute and give their thoughts on implications for you as a college lecture, or even just type in the chat facility if you're comfortable continuing with that. Opens our eyes to actions out with working environment. Yep. Always following the normal rules of engagement, honesty, integrity, looking out for others, being a decent human being. And I think that is absolutely bang on, Mary, being a decent human being. Whether we're talking about the school or the college sector, it's about being professional and doing the right thing. How does the GTC protect the lecturers from some misbehaving students, especially from a tertiary educational setting? Kamali is asking. Uh, I see someone has their hand up, but I'll just deal with what is coming in first and then I'll come to you. Uh, so in terms of protecting should, uh, lecturers from misbehaving students, it's about how you actually conduct yourself. The misbehaving students is something, I was 26 years a secondary school teacher before doing this. I know about misbehaving students. It is something that we have to deal with as part of the job. It can sometimes be stressful, and not very pleasant, but it is part of the job. You need to remain professional. You need to remain focused on your conduct when you're dealing with incidents. Regarding the misbehaving students, that gets dealt with uh, in the lecture hall or the classroom. It gets dealt with at your local level. That's not something for us. How does the G, uh, that's the one that I've just read actually. And thank you, Francis, saying been a really great session. Person with a hand up, I can't see any names. Uh, I don't know if you can see, Vicky. Is it Leon? Starts it. Yep. Go yes, for it, Leon. Thank you very is much. Is it Leon? Uh, Leonard. Leonard, does it? Right, I was just seeing the start of it there. OK. Um, thank you very much. That, that was uh, particularly useful. I would say. Um, unfortunately, for me, I was uh, 20 minutes late in joining due to something else uh, running over. Um, so I see that there's a record uh, symbol in, and I was keen to know where I might be able to access that recording or encourage some of my colleagues to access that recording as well. OK, uh, basically I'm recording it. I was requested to record it and you will have missed that uh, when I said that at the start. I yep. totally appreciate that. Uh, in terms of how we share it, to be honest, I'm going to have to liaise with our tech team here because something recorded on a GTC Scotland invite can only be viewed by GTC Scotland staff. Okay. But I have been assured that there is a way around it. So basically, I will liaise with the tech team after this and we will try to get this shared. Or perhaps is, is there... Um... Uh, an, another session or another identical session or other similar sessions that I could join again or encourage my colleagues to join. What I was going to say in the final slide, and I'll just skip on to that, and that's just uh, my name and my role on that slide, is that basically if any individual colleges are interested in any sessions regarding the fitness to teach process, that's something that I would certainly be open to. I talked to HR 
and college uh, employ college lecture on employers ten days ago about this subject. So there are, has already been a session with HR and college lecture on employers, but certainly it's something that I would be interested in arranging if you think any particular colleges out there would benefit from it. So I would certainly be open to that, Leonard. And my colleague Vicky has her hand up. Vicky, if you want to come in there. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Um, it's just to pick up on that last point from Leonard. We'll get it, it, the video into a format that can then be shared through through all colleges, and we'll probably recommend that it goes on their local intranets under GTC, so that everybody's able to do that. So hopefully, the bit you missed at the beginning, you'll be able to to pick that up again. So save you having to do another live session. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else, folks? Any other questions? Or are we all keen to get out in the sunshine? OK, I don't think there's anything else coming in, folks. So thanks very much for listening to this presentation this afternoon.